The three islands of Gozo, Camino and Malta lie almost at the centre point of the Mediterranean Sea. Historically, there is nowhere on earth like Malta, you know, from very early days, from um, Neolithic times, there's temples there. Malta is so steeped in history. If you've got that type of mind and you're interested in that, I cannot think of a better place to go than to Malta. Not just to learn about what happened to Malta, but basically what happened in the entire Mediterranean area and in Europe. And of course, very, very famous for the, the Order of St. John, the Knights of St. John. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte's fleet, en route to Egypt, stopped at Malta, looking for safe harbour and supplies. The people refused him entry, resulting in a French invasion of the islands. Uh, Napoleon was there for 12 days and laid down the Code Napoleon and the law of Malta. The Maltese appealed to the British for their assistance. Because on his way back from the Battle of Nile, Nelson threw the French out. The Admiral, he said, pop in and sort out Malta while you're there, and he did. It became a British military and naval fortress and headquarters of the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet. During the First World War, Malta became known as the nurse of the Mediterranean. It returned to its former role as a hospital and convalescent base for large numbers of soldiers wounded in Gallipoli, the Middle East and other areas of conflict within reach of the island. In addition to the Royal Navy and Army bases, the newest arm of the British forces made its first appearance on Malta. We'd been operating there since 1918, the Royal Air Force, and before 1918, the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service. Malta's preparations for a possible air war were far from advanced. Work began on RAF Takali in the late 1930s, and it opened in 1939, just prior to the outbreak of war. Takali, underneath Nina, was the main fighter base, and that was a, a rough field, if you like, um, uh, hardcore sort of rolled, but Luca was hardened, and in 1939-40 it was built as a proper hardened runway that could take fighters and the bigger bombers. Yeah. Uh, Wellington was the biggest bomber then, actually. Hamlet, or something like that. RAF Luca was opened in 1940 and became the headquarters of RAF Mediterranean Command during the Second World War. Built with two dispersed airfields at Safi and Crendi, it was the largest RAF airfield on Malta and was to become vital to the defence of the island in the Second Siege of Malta. Uh, so Luca was built in 40. There was Takani, which was the main fighter base, and there was Halfa, which was the Navy base. Malta's air defences were in a very sorry state when Air Commodore Foster Maynard, Malta's Air Officer Commanding, took charge in January 1940. He found the total strength consisted of four swordfish aircraft, a handful of sea gladiators and a radio-controlled Queen Bee. The gladiators actually belonged to the Royal Navy and were due to be embarked on HMS Glorious and HMS Eagle. In 1940, HMS Glorious was at Malta, and the Germans invaded Norway. HMS Glorious was told to drop everything and get to Norway as quickly as possible. On the 11th of April 1940, HMS Glorious left Malta. She had re-embarked nine of 802 Squadron's sea gladiators, leaving the remainder at Califrana. So Glorious sailed. On the docks it left four packing cases in Malta. In March 1940, Maynard learned that there were 12 sea gladiators being stored at Califrana, 10 of which were awaiting transfer to HMS Eagle. He managed to persuade the Mediterranean Fleet's Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Andrew Cunningham, to let him borrow four of these aircraft, which were assembled and delivered to Hal Far to form the new Malta Fighter Flight. Uh, at the same time, Mussolini decided to join the war, June 1940. Up to that moment, until he saw that Hitler was winning in uh, France, he didn't join in. Dunkirk happened. He invaded the south of France and started bombing Malta. On the 10th of June 1940, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini declared war on Great Britain. With the fall of France and the Allied loss of the French Navy in the Mediterranean, he saw his advantage. 
and started the Italian bombing campaign of Malta, an attack convoy sent to resupply the island. The outdated Halfar fighters put up a brave defence against the modern machines of the Regia Aeronautica. Nobody can be sure when the gladiators were named Faith, Hope and Charity, but according to the established legend, they were the only three fighters defending Malta. The dramatic story of the second siege of Malta, how its people held out and how the RAF repulsed over 3,000 air raids from 1940 to 1942, how the island was liberated by convoys and awarded the George Cross, and the part that Malta played in the liberation of North Africa, Sicily and Italy, and how the island restored itself from the rubble of war to its former glory will be revealed in the full version of Outposts of Empire, Malta. Well, my first tour there, it had a Shackleton squadron, anti-submarine squadron there, as well as 39. Then 13 turned up from Cyprus. The Canberras of 39 and 13 Squadron watched and recorded activities on the Soviet borders and in the Middle Eastern flashpoints. Due to increased Soviet activity in the Mediterranean, 203 Squadron were now to be based at Luka permanently to operate anti-submarine and shipping patrols. We found quite a few too. We, so yeah, we, nice. we were very good. Our, well, I say our crew one. We found a lot, yeah. what we called unalerted detections. We found two of their nuclears and one of their conventionals. Intelligence would tell us, well, there should be a Foxtrot 20 miles south of Crete going west because he's returning to the Northern Fleet or whatever. So we'd plan ahead, Dave would get on the old plot, do, do, do. He should be around about here. So we'd go around silent, no transmissions, nice and quiet, just visual. And sure as eggs are eggs, we'd get a little snort, boom, gotcha. So yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, to get two nucleus, which we very rarely saw anyway. Because now you're in the Mediterranean and everything's different and you're 20 years old and your pilot's 20 years old. Actually, Johnny, my pilot, was 21. And suddenly you're in a strange uh, environment and uh, you learn about the local area and then go low level through Italy, through Libya, round Cyprus, and then you're trusted to take a camera off to, let's say, Turkey or let's say Bahrain. But Brian and I happened to be uh, on one detachment when I think Saddam was having his first look at Kuwait. And our thoughts in Bahrain very much were in this is 1965-6, Iraq, and they're going to have a go at Kuwait. So we kept an aircraft permanently in Bahrain to watch the Shat al Arab waterway, Basra and Shaiba airfield, where if anything was going to happen, it was going to happen there. So. Uh, they were 21 years old, say, by now, with your own uh, camera, quite a powerful aircraft, just the two of you. Mm. And when you went out to the aeroplane, you were given a gun to wear a pistol across your chest, like a Mexican bandit. And across the other way, gold coins in a bandolero. You, you were required to, to, uh, to fly in places where, if you had ejected, you wouldn't have been received hospitably on the ground. So the navigator was issued with some marriage race doors and the ghoulie chits. And we said to the senior officer in Bahrain, well, those four, sir. And he said, in case you land in the desert, uh, we don't want any accident to happen to your private parts. So there's a note on there written in Arabic saying, this man is very important to the Queen of England. And if you bring him back safely with all his parts intact, we will give you lots of gold. And as an earnest of our sincerity, here's some gold to start you off. So give it to them. And if they don't like that, then you've got the gun. <laughs> yeah, we knew we were in a Cold War situation for sure. Mm. I only felt part of the Cold War in terms of all the training we did was geared around that. Um, and all the, I remember all the public service films that were broadcast. No. <laughs> Not at all. No, this is what I'm saying. You're so closeted. You they, you're looked after. The whole thing. You don't know. You know. You you're safe. You feel safe. The Nimrod was coming in, and they're both operating alongside each other. 
and they thought, oh, we'll get rid of the shack and we'll put this Nimrod in, in its place. During 1971, 203 Squadron started to retire their Shackleton aircraft and convert onto the Hawker Sidley Nimrod Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft. It was the Comet with bigger engines, the, the pannier underneath, with the bomb bay and the radar in the nose, and the thing on top of the tail, um, and the mad boom at the back. Pressurised, um, we used to climb out to transit out at about 25,000, um, descend. If we were doing a Jezebel search, we would descend to about 15,000 feet. If we were doing a radar search, of course, we were down, down in the weeds, um, two, three hundred feet, or anything in between. And then, depending on how far out we were, when you came back, you would go, I think the, the highest I've been was about 36,000. If there was um, a surface vessel in transit, like a destroyer or a frigate, we would go and check him out. Um, submarines, well, sometimes you just go out and sort of stick your toe in the water, really, and see if there was anything there. So Walter uh, in the 70s was a little tense because the British were leaving and they knew we were leaving. Uh, and we kept everything as smooth as we could and carried on doing our job. Despite negotiations to keep the British bases open, the Maltese and British governments failed to reach an agreement. And a timetable for the final departure of British forces from Malta was drawn up. After 180 years, the first arm of the British services to arrive on Malta in 1800, the Royal Navy, were very appropriately the last to leave. <laughs> <laughs>